One thing that the famous philosopher Sigmund Freud said is that Wir möchten mehr vom Ich erfahren, seitdem wir wissen, dass auch das Ich unbewusst im eigentlichen Sinne sein kann. Now even if you did speak German, the statement would probably be hard to understand. But basically, what he's saying is that we wish to learn more about the ego ever since we've discovered that it can have a subconscious mind of its own. So, what is the ego? Well, the ego is us. It is the part of our mind that controls our desires, our perception, and our defenses. The defense mechanisms of our ego were a speciality of Anna Freud, Sigmund's sixth daughter, and she defined them as a procedure that protects an individual when anxiety becomes too overwhelming. In your life alone, you have probably used many, if not all, of the nine main defense mechanisms. And of these, denial, repression, and displacement are quite common, but they are also the most damaging. In Catherine Mansfield's short story, The Fly, the protagonist, the boss, experiences these defense mechanisms. And by following his story, we can see how these mechanisms work and what kind of damage they cause. When we are introduced to the boss through a Freudian lens, we would categorize him as being primarily super ego. He rolled in his office chair, stout, rosy, still going strong, still at the helm, the boss in every sense of the word. His first piece of dialogue is dedicated to all his new office positions. I've had it done up lately. New carpet, new furniture, electric heating too. Showing just how saturated his mind is with the sociological ideas that we need to impress people with what we own. From a psychoanalytical perspective, the boss's desire to flaunt his new materialistic positions reveals his egocentric nature. In fact, the corruption of the boss's superego is shown not through the positions he does mention, but in those he doesn't. He did not draw old Woody Field's attention to the photograph over the table of a grave-looking boy in uniform. The boss's attempts to forget his son's death by pretending this tragic event didn't occur is what Anna Freud would call a form of repression where your mind simply forgets any unpleasant experiences instead of trying to cope with its consequences. His new material positions are therefore an attempt at substitution for his lost son, a way for him to acquiesce his grief. The boss introduces the wealth of his positions to people instead of introducing people to his successful son that he would otherwise have. Along with this repression, the boss has also been in a state of denial, denying all mentions of his son's death. We see this during the boss's and old Woodyfield's conversation, where when Woodyfield mentions his daughters visiting his son's grave, the boss makes no reply. Only a quiver in his eyelids showed that he had heard. The boss's ego had been using this mechanism to bash all conscious thoughts of his son's death instead of dealing with the fact that he is no longer there, because the reality of the fact was just too hard to deal with. We learn in the story that the boss was really invested in his son. Ever since his birth, the boss had worked at building this business for him. It had no meaning if it was not for the boy. The way the boss always planned for his son could reveal that his own personal life plan was to build a foundation for his son and then live in retirement vicariously through his son's achievements. The reason the boss is struggling with his loss so much more than another would is because he is now sitting on the foundation of an empire without a successor. Repression and denial can be beneficial ways of dealing with trauma. However, in the long term, these problems only manifest and become harder and harder to tackle. We see this issue after old Woodyfield leaves and the boss attempts to lock himself in his office to cry for his lost son. He had arranged to weep, only to find that he wasn't feeling as he wanted to feel. So after both denial and repression fail, the boss's ego seeks another defense mechanism to settle the emotions of his id. The defense mechanism of displacement is the redirection of emotions to a more hapless victim. So when the boss notices that a fly had fallen into his broad ink pot, he was, perhaps unconsciously, attempting to grieve for a son by abusing and torturing an insignificant fly. He plunged his pen back into the ink, 
leaned his thick wrist on the blotting paper, and as the fly tried its wings, down came a great heavy blot. The boss's torturing and killing the fly as a way of displacing his distraught emotions caused by his son's death and his own battling ego. He is yelling at the fly like a commander would, telling it to come on and look sharp, as if his own super ego is yelling at his id to get it together. But with that, Mansfield tells us that that tactic didn't work, as nothing happened or was likely to happen. The fly was dead. By analysing Mansfield's piece of writing, we can follow the boss's ego and how it copes with the tragedy of his son's death, which is to say, not very well. However, we can learn from this character's experience and be warned from these dangerous defence mechanisms as we can quite often find ourselves in a state of super-ego anxiety in such a demanding society.